John is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Sainsbury Wellcome Centre within UCL, and he's a Principal Research Fellow of the Wellcome Trust. <laughs> you will, anybody who doesn't know him will realise when he starts speaking that he's not a native Londoner. Um, he came to the UK from America via, from the US via Canada, but he arrived in 1967 at UCL. He's stayed there ever since. Um, and I find that quite remarkable for all sorts of reasons, but basically because all the career advice I was ever given was that you should move around to get on in the world in terms of a scientific career. You couldn't stay in one place all the time. And now, as I'm sure you've realised, John has focused on hippocampal formation in spatial and episodic memory and navigation. And in 2014, as the culmination of this research so far, he was awarded both the Kavli Prize for Neuroscience and the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of so-called place cells. He stayed in the same place, but he's done very well. <laughs> These cells, which create an inner GPS, enable us to orient ourselves, and John is now applying this research to the study of Alzheimer's dementia, which again, I guess, as we get older, is going to engage more and more of us with urgency. So I'm not going to say any more before he gives the lecture or read out what's written in the programme, but the time's come to welcome John, and I'm delighted to introduce him for his lecture, What Rodents Have Taught Us About Spatial Cognition and Memory. John. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here to give the Stephen Paget Lecture. If you look back through the list of, of previous lecturers, it's, it's actually quite daunting. Um, and if you go no farther back than just the previous two lectures, it's, 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 very, um, it's very daunting. Um, four years ago, Clive Page gave a lecture on um, the role of animal research in the development of, of medicines for asthma and particularly the work of David Jack uh, um, for uh, developing salbuterol and salbuterol. Um, and I have to say, I particularly have been a beneficiary of, of that research because I spent about nine, nine days in hospital about several years ago suffering from an acute asthma attack. And when I found out, uh, uh, it was David Jack's work that had been um, an instrumental in providing the medicines which cured me. I was, I was quite um, daunted and humbled. And of course, following Colin Lever, uh, sorry, Colin uh, Blakemore, even at a, 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 a distance of, of, of two years, is also quite daunting. Um, in his lecture, Colin gave four stories about brain research and uh, how they relied on animal research. Um, and then, uh, in addition, eloquently addressed some of the ethical and practical uh, problems um, and issues involved in the use of animals in, in brain research. And um, I hope to address some of them um, and at least um, sp speak to the issue of how we see those issues and, and how they're addressed in our own research. The title of my talk is um, What Rhodes Have Taught Us About Spatial Cognition and Memory. <clears throat> Hopefully, this will work. Already everything's uh, frozen here, so I must be doing something wrong. called the hippocampus, really started with the work of Brenda Milner. Uh, and Brenda Milner was, was already um, a, 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 a luminary um, when I was at McGill in the 1960s. Um, and she was known best for her um, work on the patient HM and for elucidating the psychological uh, and particularly the memory problems that HM uh, exhibited. HM was a severe epileptic. And he was operated on by the, uh, the surgeon uh, Scoville. And in fact, 
to try to alleviate um, some of the some of the um, disabilities from from his uh, epileptic seizures. <clears throat> to some extent, the um, the surgery, which involved removal on both sides of the inferior temporal lobes, uh, was a success in that his seizures were reduced and the amount of medication that he needed to take was reduced. On the other hand, he presented immediately after the operation with a severe and dense amnesia. He, for all intents and purposes, had lost his memories for the events that had happened to him in everyday life. Brenda Milner, um, who's still going strong, and uh, she's having her 100th birthday uh, this year. She's having several parties, um, one in Montreal and one in New York. Um, spent many years trying to understand what aspects of memory were lost in HM. And her best student, Suzanne Corkin, uh, who unfortunately uh, had died recently, um, was also involved in that research. Suzanne uh, summarized all of the work on HM um, uh, to date in this, in this uh, very important and very, very readable book. Um, and what she concluded was that the problem with HM was that he cannot recall anything that relied on personal experience, such as a specific Christmas gift his father had given to him. He retained only the gist of personally experienced events, plain facts, but no re recollection of specific episodes. So he no, not only could not learn new facts and, 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 and new uh, and, and, and story information about his uh, experiences after the operation, but he had lost quite a few of the, the things that he knew before the, the, uh, the, the operation. And he seemed to have lost what we would now call episodic memory, the ability to recall what you um, had experienced yesterday, the day before, uh, uh, or last year. So when I started thinking about the, the research um, enterprise that I would engage in, I thought, this is really uh, a golden opportunity. We know that this part of the brain must have something to do with memory, but of course, exactly what memories would look like at the cellular level was something that nobody knew about. So I decided to uh, actually see if I could see what memories look like by recording the neural activity of rodents, and specifically rats, um, and see what, see what memories look like. Now, the justification for that is that um, if we look at the structure uh, that was removed in HM, uh, the main structure was removed was the hippocampus, nestled here inside of the temporal lobes, and here is the same structure in, 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 in rodents. And if we take cross-sections, anatomical cross-sections, through the hippocampus, either of, of uh, humans or of rodents or of monkeys, what we see is anatomically, they look very, very similar, and they seem to have many of the cells, same cell types and many of the same connections. So you see here in the rodents, you see that they're, um, the major cell type, the pyramidal cells, all line up in this wonderfully uh, simple uh, layer here and there's another layer here, and they're essentially formed two interlocking seats. And if one looks at the monkey, one sees a similar kind of architecture and similar to the human. So at least as a first pass, one might think that these two structures in humans and rodents might have some similarity in their, in their function. But I have to say, this research was, and in some cases, in some uh, senses, still curiosity-driven research. I really was interested in trying to understand what the neural basis of, of memory was. And I was aware already that the rat is probably not going to be a perfect model. Um, and it's not a, a perfect model for, for uh, many functions in humans. It's certainly for the cognitive and memory capacities of humans. So the question then is, what role does the hippocampus play in the life of the rat? <coughs> I wasn't trying to, as it were, see the rat hippocampus as a model for, for human memory. I was trying to see what it does for the rat. And the belief then is that maybe understanding this might give insights into human memory. It wasn't going to be a simple one-to-one -one 
correspondence or translation between the two. But if you knew what this system was doing for the rat and its importance in the rat's life, then we might be able to see how, with suitable modifications, it might function really well. But probably, and it was a case at the time, this was only going to be uh, possible as an indirect um, uh, uh, expansion of our understanding. This, of course, is, involves an, an ethical conund conundrum. What we would like to do if we want to understand certain aspects of, of, of the human brain and certain aspects of, of the human mind is we would like to find an animal which, um, which actually captures many of the aspects that we're interested in, um, but insofar as it captures all of them, and as insofar as we're looking at animals which are approximately <coughs> approaching the human capacity, either in cognition or emotion, then we're faced with this ethical uh, dilemma where, of course, we then have to uh, have a very uh, clear understanding and, and attitude towards the ethical use of those animals. So it's a kind of what we would like to do is find animals which are close enough to the human being um, and the human function, uh, but not so close that, the, that we are uh, faced with, with uh, 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 severe ethical concerns. Well, it turned out that, uh, and I think my lecture will demonstrate that that's in fact the case with, with the rat uh, memory system, and particularly the, the spatial memory system, as I'll tell you. So what we did um, is we placed, here's again the, the, the rat rodent hippocampus, and if you look at a cross-section through it, this is what it looks like, as I've already shown you. And we placed tiny electrical recording uh, electrodes into the hippocampus, uh, under deep surgical anesthesia um, and taking care of, of the animal's uh, post-operative recovery. And then after the animal had returned to normal function, we looked at the activity of one or a small number of uh, neurons in this part of the brain as the animal was going about different spatial uh, and non-spatial behaviors. And of course, we were particularly interested in memory, so we gave the animal little memory tasks. Um, and what we found, uh, to make a long story short, is shown in this slide here, uh, in the first publication of uh, our work on the spatial functioning of the hippocampus and spatial uh, attributes and, and, and correlates of, of hippocampal cells. What we found is that the cells weren't interested in actually what the animal was doing so much. They weren't interested in why the animal was doing it, but they were actually interested in where the animal was doing the behavior. So here's an animal wandering around on a tabletop, essentially. And um, here's a curtain to map, uh, to sort of uh, to, uh, give it the animal only a, a limited view of, of the, the rest of the laboratory, and to include all the other um, aspects of the, of, the, of the laboratory. And what we saw is that as the animal went around this environment, uh, visiting different places, that the cells, um, and particularly this fellow here, were essentially silent over most of the environment and only became active when you came over into this patch of the environment here. And you can see that here in this histogram which shows you the number of action potentials per unit time. So if he's in A or in B, you get quite a bit of activity, but when he's in these other areas here, there's no activity at all. Subsequently, we've refined, and other people have refined the methods for doing these experiments. Um, we've uh, introduced uh, overhead cameras so that we can automatically track the animal's position by looking at and monitoring little lights on the animal's head. Uh, we can tell where the animal is as it explores uh, an environment, and in this case, a square environment, looking for little bits of food. And we can tell where the cells fire as the animal goes around that environment. And what we see, uh, as shown here, we see that, for example, as the animal moves around this square environment, as shown in this black line here, the cell only is, is quiet most of the time, but only becomes active when it comes over to this southwest corner. And we can um, represent this by a false color map here, a heat map where the red colors show how active the cell is and where it's most active, and uh, warmer colors uh, show uh, lesser fire rates. And you can see that there's a very nice representation of this corner of the box uh, by this type of activity. This is a, uh, a cartoon that we made 
which shows the, uh, the activity. It's real activity. Here's the animal running around, and when he comes here, um, we put little red dots, and you can hear the cells firing as he comes to that uh, particular location. You can see he runs all over the box. He's looking for food, which is thrown in randomly, and it's only when he comes here that he actually uh, causes this cell to fire. One of the things you might notice is that the cell fires irrespective of the movement of the animal through that location. It doesn't matter whether he's moving north or south or east or west. Telling us that, that this is not a simple, um, that this is not a simple cell responding to a simple, say, visual stimulus, but a cell which is constructing some notion about space. And we believe that the idea of places is something that the brain constructs. And it's not, there aren't places in the outside world. Uh, it's a construct of, of, of the brain which enables the animals to uh, uh, locate itself and to locate other uh, objects in the world. Now, if we look at not one cell, but many cells at the same time, we see something interesting. What we see, and here are a group of cells, and here are the activity of these different cells. What we see is that each of them has its own preferred area in the environment. And if we map where in the environment each of these cells fire, then we see that every place the animal goes, whether it's running along the north edge of the box, or the south edge of the box, or the west or the east edge of the box, there's one, a representation in one of these cells. So the animal moves around, the activity moves around on the surface of the hippocampus to track where the animal is and provide a representation for every location in any environment. Now this is a small number of cells, it's only about 30, uh, 32 cells. There are hundreds of thousands of cells in, in the hippocampus of the rat. And so the representation of an environment is, uh, is carried out over and over again in, in, in these cells. Well, thinking about this, um, a chap called Maydell and myself, um, and you can see there's a picture taken from the, from the 1970s. Um, decided that perhaps the hippocampus was acting as some sort of a map. That it was providing the animal with information about where it was in the familiar environment, where other things were, objects of desire, such as food, um, or places to avoid. And that these place cells, as we call them, were actually acting as the, the anchors for locations and locational signals in that, in that mapping system. So we said the map of environment is composed of a set of place representations. If you have a lot of place representations, A, B, C, that will provide you with the, the bare bones of a mapping system. And they could be activated just by the information that's coming in to the animal at a particular location in, in the environment. However, in addition to that, having just a bunch of place representations does not make a map. Because what you need to know in addition is the spatial relationships between those place representations. It's not enough to know that you're here, or there, or over there. You need to know the spatial relationships between those uh, different locations. And we thought that the way to do this was by creating a set of vector representations in mathematical notation, which connect the places in the map of environment uh, together in terms of the distance and directions between them. So A and B would be connected together by a vector AB, which represented the distance and direction in some framework between those two locations. Animals using such a map would be able to locate themselves in an environment and locate objects such as rewards and punishments in that environment and move from one place to another by any available route. Okay, that's a theory. Theories are only so good as they're testable. And in order to test it, we made two very, very specific predictions. We predicted that animals which had damage to the hippocampus would have deficits in place learning knowing that they were in a particular location, navigation, how to go from that location to some other desired location, and exploration, which we thought might be 
the basis on which gnats were constructed. They thought that gnats were probably constructed not because the animal was hungry or thirsty, but because it actually had an internal system for driving curiosity and which said to it, said to the rest of the brain, I don't really understand this environment. I don't have a map of this environment. Why don't you explore and, and actually provide the information for creating that map? We also, and I'll come back to this in the, in the second part of the talk, predicted that if this really were a map, then there would have to be uh, not only these place cells, but information in the hippocampal formation, either in the hippocampus itself or related areas, which were providing information about these vectors, about distances and directions in an environment. And as I'll tell you, we now have information both uh, about both of these predictions, which, which strongly confirm those predictions. Sometime very soon after we were propagating and promulgating this theory, uh, Richard Morris, who was then at Edinburgh, uh, came into the lab and said, OK, I think I know how to test at least one part of your prediction. I think I can construct a behavioral task which will show whether the animals deprived of the hippocampus no longer can navigate the way that you suggest. And Richard's idea was actually to come up with what could colloquially be called a rat swimming pool. Very simple tub of water filled with milky water where the animal can't see below the surface and in which is placed a small platform that when the animal gets to the platform, if it knows where it is and it can find it, it can climb up onto the platform and then escape from the pool. And it turns out that animals, as I'll show you in a second, learn this task very quickly. So one of the nice things about these spatial navigation tasks is that animals seem to know exactly what they're supposed to do. They don't take a lot of training uh, and, and familiarization with the apparatus. They know very well that if they're put in a pool and, and there's a platform there, they can go and find it. And within about eight trials in, 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 in the best animals, uh, the animals can learn to go directly from where they're placed, any place in the water maze, to this location here. And of course, they must do that by using some kind of a map-like representation, by looking around the pool, looking at the objects in the room, and saying, well, oh, that's the location over there that I need to go to. And we were delighted to find that animals which had damage to this part of the brain, the hippocampus, lost that ability uh, to, to do that, and didn't lose their ability to do most other things in our, in our hands. Uh, I thought I would show you just a, a picture, um, a little video that Richard has put onto the web, which gives you some flavor for this uh, task. Here is the room, and there's the swimming pool, and here's the milky water, and here's the hidden platform. And the idea is the animal is placed down and he swims. This is an animal which is trained to, uh, to find the platform. And he goes, and after he's on the platform, he's taken off. Um, you can do all kinds of manipulations to see what's going on in his mind by, for example, removing the platform. Now he's starting from another uh, location. And he swims directly to the place where the platform should be, but isn't. And of course, he's a clever rat, so he swims around and around and around, looking for the platform. And of course, since he's a clever rat, and you can show where he's going by looking at this overhead tracking system, after a while he says, actually, this is probably a psychological experiment, so they probably need the platform. And he starts swimming off looking for the platform in the other parts of the day. Um, but it gives you a very strong impression that he knows where that uh, platform is, <laughs> and he knows the direction of that platform from, from different places. OK, well, Richard's work sits um, in a long uh, series of, uh, of uh, experimental work on rats finding their way around mazes. And this, this uh, work started with uh, Willard Small in, in the Clark University lab at the turn of the century, 1901. And Clark and his, and his colleagues were interested in it, un, trying to understand the uh, workings of the rat mind. Did they have a mind, and, and, and what would they use it for? And uh, he was advised by his, uh, his thesis advisor to find a maze and see how rats learn the maze. And he took the Hampton Court maze as a model, 
And of course, here's the maze, and you can see people wandering around in it. I don't know how many people have actually experienced it. It's, it's quite a difficult task, um, because there are all kinds of, of blind alleys and next to them. And what he did was he essentially used the layout, but, but regularized it. He, he linearized it, and studied how rats found their way from the start of the year to the year. Well, it, that gave rise to a large amount of rat running literature, much of it in the United States, much of it uh, on either the East Coast or the West Coast, in which people try to modify mazes to see if they could actually understand what it was that the animal was doing and how it was solving the problem of the maze. So this is one of the mazes. This is the Sto Stone's um, multiple T maze. And what Stone realized is that the best way of, of assessing what the animal is doing is by giving it a series of left and right choices. So you start the animal at the entrance here, and he runs up to the first choice point, and then he has a choice between going left or right. If he makes the correct move, he goes here, and then he's given another, essentially, teammate's choice, and so on and so forth, through 24 of these choices. But what this means is that the animal can make mistakes, but it doesn't, he doesn't have to pay the price later on for making the mistakes earlier on the maze. If he goes wrong here, then he still can go back and get this one right and so on and so forth. Out of a lot of experimentation like this, um, although many psychologists originally thought <coughs> that the rat was a very simple learning machine, a stimulus-response learning machine, and that he was, what he was doing was going up to the choice point and saying, go left, go to this one, say, go right. And he was essentially learning a series of left-right turns. They began to see evidence that the animal was doing something much more sophisticated. This, by the way, is just like, uh, what the maze looks like from the animal's point of view. And what they noticed is that if you looked at the mistakes that the animal made, <coughs> it became pretty clear that they were not just learning stimulus-response associations. They were doing some more cognitive processing that couldn't be reduced to just simple stimulus response uh, associations. And one of the best people who um, studied the, the, these kinds of, of, of uh, changes uh, was a man called the shield. And so, for example, if they looked at the, re the, the errors that an animal made, uh, or, or the animals tended to make on this maze, what they found is that they tended to make this choice very, they found this choice very, very difficult. Uh, or they found this choice very, very difficult. Uh, or they found choices that are very far away from the goal very difficult. So thinking about that and analyzing what the mistakes were, they realized, as shown here, that there's a considerable evidence of some backward order principle in learning in the maze of situation. The blinds are more difficult the farther they are away from the goal. Not all choices were equivalent. But importantly, other factors that appear to be important in determining the order of difficulty of the blind alleys are the absolute direction of the animals from and the choice from the goal. The animals seem to have some knowledge which couldn't just be reduced to simple behaviorist association. It seemed to know where the goal was, and particularly the direction of the goal. Thinking about those, that whole long history, and thinking about the success of the water maze, and I have to say the water maze is probably the most successful piece of behavioral apparatus that's ever been invented. Those three original publications from Richard Morris have 15,000 citations. If you go into any drug company or you go into any um, university laboratory, you'll find the water maze. It's a very simple piece of apparatus, but it is very elegant in its conceptual, uh, uh, the, the concept of, uh, of that, it is, um, that it's fired in, and also in, in, in terms of uh, it, what it tells us about the animal. Thinking about that, we thought it would be nice if we could meld the, um, the, the, the uh, positive aspects of the water maze and one of these standard uh, mazes that had been used historically, the Stones maze, for example. And what we came up with was a, a, a version of the water maze, which is a land-based water maze, in which, um, which in this case is, uh, consists of 
37 individually movable platforms, which can all be up at one time, if we uh, so wish, or where only one or several can be up at the same time. And what this enables us to do, as I'll show you in the next picture, is to um, give the animal a water maze-like task, ask it to do what it's asked to do in the water maze, which is to find some particular location in the environment, but where we can control the choices that are given to it at any given point. So for example, we can, if the animal wants to go over here, we can actually, um, if it's sitting on this platform, we can give it these two choices, or, as shown here, where one of the choices, if the animal is on the blue uh, platform, one of the choices actually represents the direction to the goal, and another is a very poor choice from that point of view. But we can also ask it to go to the goal and take one of two choices, neither of which are very good. So can the animal actually compute which is the best path to the goal, even though neither of them are perfect? Let me show you what it looks like. Here is an animal sitting on the start platform. He's been trained to go to a goal uh, down here. Um, and you'll see what he does. And I think what's nice about this maze is you can actually almost read what's going on in his mind. You can see what he would like to do. You can see the knowledge that he has about where the goal is. And even though we are actually forcing him to go somewhere else, he's telling us by his behavior that he understands the direction to the goal. So the goal is down here, and what you'll see is he's presented with a series of choices, a sequence of choices, uh, which eventually get him to the goal, but not always by the route that he would, he would actually uh, prefer. And here he is, and he knows the goal is here. You can see he's looking in that direction. <laughs> and then eventually, he says, hmm. <coughs> and he knows that he's going to be given several choices. So he eventually turns around and looks at, this is 135 degrees from the direction of the goal, and this is 180 degrees. So this is, in fact, the right way to go. Actually, the right thing to do would be if he could just stay where he is, he's closer to the goal. Um, so he knows that, but he reluctantly knows that he can't stay there forever. We can get him to go wherever we want by just giving him one platform. And here he goes now, he's, and he chooses the correct one here because he wants to go down here. Here's another good choice, heading to right now. Here's another one, and he almost doesn't even have to wait for the platform to come up before he chooses it. And every once in a while, he actually stops and thinks quite a bit. And I think you can almost see him thinking, and then finally he chooses the correct one, and then this is the goal. And at that point, when he goes to the goal platform, we then put food on the goal platform. So when, there is, when he's running the test, there is no food on the goal. He has to know the correct platform without actually knowing the, where the, where. Um... Okay. Well, this is a very good task, like the water maze, for assessing damage in the hippocampus. Uh, normal rats learn quickly and make more mistakes when they're farther from the goal and when asked to head away from the goal. So it's exactly like the historical uh, uh, the results told us we should be finding that there is something about knowing the direction for the goal and also something about actually the farther the animal gets away from the goal, the harder it is to do. And hippocampal animals, animals with damage in the hippocampus, have impaired performance and are selectively affected by the, the factors. They're even worse. Normal animals are worse when they have to make a choice away from the goal. Hippocampal animals are, are even worse. Okay, well back to the theory, um, and the theory also predicted that there should be the existence of hippocampus, in the hippocampus or around the hippocampus, of those signals which were telling the animal and the hippocampus where other locations were. So when he's in one location, what's the direction and the distance between those locations? Where is the information about these vectors? And I'll summarize about 40 years' worth of research in, in two or three sentences. Because in our own laboratory and in many other laboratories around the world, there has been intensive search for those signals. Here are the hippocampal place cells, as we call them, which are located in the hippocampus here, these two interlocking C-shaped uh, cell body structures. 
And those cells, by and large, in open field environments, don't care about the direction in which the animal is facing. As I showed you, they're happy to fire if the animal is heading north or south or east or west. They're interested in the place and not directions. On the other hand, there is another group of cells, not in the hippocampus proper, but in this part of the hippocampal formation, which are called head direction cells, and were discovered um, by Jim Rock in, in, in New York in the 1980s. Um, and they're not interested in where the animal is. They're interested in exactly the opposite, the, uh, the uh, converse uh, type of information. They fire all over the place, as shown by this heat map. Um, but they only do so if the animal is pointing in a particular direction. So they're conveying information about the direction within the room framework that the animal is pointing. And just like the place cells, different cells have different preferred directions. And if you manage to rotate the heading direction, the preferred heading direction of one of them, they all rotate. So they look like they're forming something like a compass, but it's not a geomagnetic compass. It's a compass which is, um, which is related to the frame of reference of, of the laboratory uh, that the animal finds itself in. We also know there are cells which monitor the distance from the walls. How far away am I from the walls? And we think this is part of the sensory information which is telling one of these play cells where it is. <coughs> so if the animal knows he's a certain distance from that wall <coughs> and a certain distance from this a landmark in this direction, if you put those together, you can create this notion of place just on the basis of the sensory information. And finally, um, and, and, and notably, um, the information about how far the animal is going in a particular direction, the information that you need to construct these vectors, which relate two places together, was discovered by uh, the Mosers in, in Trondheim in, in 2005. So it took that long, almost 30 years, to discover the last important, uh, 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 important part of the jigsaw puzzle. These are cells which have place fields, but not just one. Many of these, most of these cells have only one place field in, in the store, small standard environment that we use, but a multiplicity of these fields. And you can see there are several of these fields. And if you look closely, you can see that the architecture of the firing of these cells is such that they lay out a grid-like pattern, which is why they call called grid cells. And this is a pattern which is uh, highly regular and highly symmetrical, and essentially the firing of these cells <laughs> occurs at the peaks of um, isosceles triangles. And we think those are the cells, at least one of the jobs of those cells, is actually to tell the animal and the rest of the system how far uh, the animal is going in, uh, as it travels in a particular <coughs> direction. You can imagine the, the animal is moving in this direction, and the cells are brup, brup, brup. And he says, I've gone three throats, as it were. Um, and it's some sort of metric that we're not quite sure yet whether that's the whole story. And we know that at least part of this symmetry is, uh, is controlled by the actual shape of the environment that the animal finds itself in. We usually use highly symmetrical environments, either circles or squares. And when you start changing the shape of the environment, then this symmetrical pattern is distorted slightly. So we still have a lot to learn about it. <coughs> At least one of the jobs we think it's doing is to provide the metric system for that. OK, so I've been talking for a little while now about this system in rodents. And the question has always been there, and I won't even say in the back of our mind, in the front of our mind, what does this have to do with HM? What does this have to do with human memory? And we found it very difficult to think of how we would actually test human memory, spatial memory, of the sort that we were testing an animal. Because what we're looking at is the animal's ability to navigate around large-scale environments. And it was only in, in, until um, sometime in the mid-1990s that these first-person shoot 'em up um, games for um, for, um, for um, finding your way around and finding monsters and finding uh, uh, various uh, politically incorrect aspects of the environment became available. And they came with editors so that you could take the game apart 
and you could get rid of many of the aspects that were not relevant to, to your interests. Uh, and when I say you can, this was done um, mainly by Neil Burgess, um, who is um, uh, who was, is a mathematical physicist, who undertook to take apart one of these fairly large scale games um, and to leave us with a very complex environment. This is the environment of 70 by 70 meters here, which consisted of many rooms and main thoroughfares, and you can see one of the main thoroughfares here, um, but included things like a movie so that uh, you could go and watch this avant-garde movie. Um, it included places like billiards rooms and bars and so on and so forth. So it's a very complex environment which is presented on a video screen and which it takes about uh, an hour from, from, from most people to get the feeling that they know their way around it. Of course, what you have then is you have an environment where you can test large scale navigation. For example, when the uh, person has their head in a scanner and ask the question, is the hippocampus or other parts of the brain involved in this type of spatial memory and state spatial navigation? So Neil and, and myself and, and uh, got together with Eleanor McGuire, who's a very clever, um, um, very clever psychologist, um, who is also now in, in, in London. And we did just that. We scanned people's brains, and originally in PET scans, uh, more recently in fMRI scans, and asked people to go from one place in the environment to um, another place. We showed them a picture of the other place, and they had to go by the best, uh, the best, uh, the, the best route that they could devise. And what we found is that when you do the appropriate controls for movement and things like that, there are really only two parts of the brain which are involved in this kind of, of, of behavior. There's the hippocampus here, as shown uh, right here in the mesial part of the temporal lobe. Here's a broader picture of it, and uh, two lateral views. And another part uh, up here in the parietal cortex, which is also known to be involved in localizing uh, things in the world, but really localizing them not in terms of this spatial cognitive mapping framework, but in terms of where they are relative to the body. And it, it's, it's part of the way in which you, you have to find your way around the environment by moving relative to, to objects in the environment. And it turned out that the better these uh, people were at navigating, the more activity there was in the hippocampus. So if they took a, we, we plotted the routes that they took, so if they took a very, very direct route from, say, A to B in this environment, um, then you got uh, quite a bit of activity in, uh, as measured by blood flow in the hippocampus. And if they took more circuitous routes, like this fellow here, uh, this, this chap went around the corner here and came back to the, to the correct goal, uh, the correct location, but um, did it by a circuitous route, or this, um, this one went completely awry and never got there. They had less activation in the hippocampus. So there was not only evidence that the hippocampus was involved in this wayfinding, in this, um, in this navigation, but the better that people were at the, the navigation, the more active their hippocampus were. Now, Eleanor um, is famous because she then went on to ask the question well, if the hippocampus really is crucial to navigation, is there a group of people? who are better navigators than all the rest of us? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's the London taxi cabs. <coughs> London taxi cab drivers have spent at least two or three years learning, um, learning their way around um, the, um, the uh, streets of London. And they do so uh, to, the, to the level that they can actually find their way from any one of the 23, 25,000 streets in London to any other one. And they can even do it taking into account traffic conditions and the weather and things like that. So they have this extraordinary knowledge of the streets of London and their interrelationships. So Eleanor said, well, what does the hippocampus look like? And what she did was she just did structural scans of taxi cab drivers' brains with a particular view of looking at the hippocampus and compared them to, um, to all the non-taxi cab drivers. And eventually, she compared them to bus drivers. And of course, that's a good comparison because taxi cab drivers have to find their way by using these circuitous routes and by taking into account, whereas bus drivers 
travel around London a lot, but they always go along um, more or less the same way. And what she found was that this part of the hippocampus here, shown in yellow, is actually larger in, hippocam in, in taxi cab drivers. Um, of course, there's no free lunch, so the, the, uh, the other part of the hippocampus is slightly smaller. Um, and, um, but uh, it certainly is the case that if you use your hippocampus a lot to find your way around, then you can expect it to grow. You're not born to be a taxi cab driver. It's not that you have a big hippocampus and that then uh, leads you or predisposes you to take a job which utilizes that, that uh, ability. Because the longer you've been a taxi cab driver, the larger the, um, the structure grows. And if you stop being a taxi cab driver, it relaxes back to uh, an economical size. Well, another strong piece of evidence that we're on the right track by using the rat hippocampus to tell us something about the hippocampus uh, comes from studies in which um, um, patients who are epileptic and, and candidates for epilepsy surgery have implanted electrodes in the hippocampus and where for a short period of time, um, in addition to looking for epileptic activity, um, one can carry out experiments uh, uh, to see what the cells in the human hippocampus are doing. Um, this work is only done in a very small number of centers. Um, in, in this case, it's a center in, in, in Pennsylvania. There's another center in, in California. And people see lots of different things. I don't want to lead you astray to tell you that all they see in the hippocampus of humans is something to do with space. I mean, one notable uh, finding is there are cells in the human hippocampus which respond selectively to Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> um, and you can present the name Jennifer Aniston, you can present pictures of her, you can present uh, pictures of people she knows and so on and so forth. But there is certainly a, a considerable amount of research now where if you use a virtual reality environment, and here are a couple of screenshots and here's what it looks like, and ask people to find their way around in a virtual environment and, and monitor their, um, uh, their activity in, in the hippocampus here, you find that there are cells uh, for example, this one which fires here, or this one which fires here selectively, very much uh, as we would have predicted and as we see it in, in the maps. So at least insofar as the cellular activity and activation is uh, uh, in, in fMRI and imaging studies is concerned, um, one of the functions of the human hippocampus, one of the memory functions, is, um, is to uh, form some sort of a, a spatial mapping system. Okay, and in the last few minutes, um, I want to just tell you a little bit about where we're going with this. Um, as I said, when we first started this work, it was purely curiosity driven. We were interested in what this part of the brain did and how it operated um, in, in, in memory studies and, and what cells are doing uh, when an animal is learning things. But sometime in the middle of the 1980s, it began to be obvious that the hippocampus might be a very good model for the study of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is, 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 uh, is actually uh, growing in, in prevalence and um, it's uh, people over 60 uh, years, these are already a little out of date in terms of the figures, but people over 60 years old uh, have an incidence of about 5.5% in, in Western Europe and 6.5% in North America in terms of, of coming down with Alzheimer's. And we asked the question, and I'll show you what was the impetus for this in the next slide, can we use our understanding of hippocampal function to study Alzheimer's disease in animal and human uh, models? So this is a good example of where we study the structure, try to understand um, a competence and the type of memory for its own sake, but where we now begin to see that this might help us in, in beginning to address um, a, a major um, a disease. And the reason that's the case is that if you look at the um, toxic proteins which are involved in, in Alzheimer's, and particularly the tau, uh, these are tau tangles, uh, and these are amyloid plaques, and you look at the different stages of Alzheimer's, what you see, and this is according to Brack, at the earliest stages, these tangles and the tau are localized in exactly the hippocampal formation. They're, they're, they're located in exactly the places 
in the brain where the, uh, the grid cells are found. And that, what happens then, it seems as though the, the, these malignant proteins actually spread out uh, over time and move into the hippocampus proper and then spread out from there into the surrounding cortex until they invade virtually the whole of the cortical mantle and other, other areas. So that led us to think, well, maybe we can use our knowledge of the spatial functions and the navigation functions of the, um, of the, of the hippocampus to do two things. Uh, in the first place, perhaps we can actually construct memory tasks and particularly spatial memory tasks, which would able, enable us to tap into the earliest stages of, 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 of the disease. And I think it's pretty well um, uh, be believed in the community that Alzheimer's is, when it, it's, it's there for many, many years prior to its clinical manifestation. And the idea is, could we find a task which is actually sensitive enough to show the earliest stages of, of the disease and of course, if, you, if we ever do find some therapy, and right now there isn't really a, a successful therapy, then it would be nice to be able to select people who are at the uh, earlier stages and, 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 and provide them with that therapy. So this is one of the, the tasks that, uh, that people, in, uh, particularly Neil Burgess and other people, uh, including Dennis Chan, uh, have come up with to test spatial memory functions in, in normal and uh, in, in, uh, and, and in patients. Um, Dennis is a, uh, a, a, he's the dementia, uh, uh, he's a dementia, dementia neurologist at Cambridge and, and, and Neil Burgess is, is the one who first in, uh, came up with the, the, um, with the uh, uh, virtual reality environment. And it's a very simple task actually. Um, what you do is you present a picture of four mountains shown from a particular perspective and then after a delay, you take that picture away, you present four other pictures, and you say, which of these are the same mountains? Not necessarily seen from the same perspective. And it's not an easy task, uh, because the mountains are roughly the same color there. Um, they have uh, different shapes. And you have to actually say, well, what's the spatial relationship between these four mountains? And how would it look from different perspectives? And it's this one which is actually the correct. And they validated this by actually giving this, ta giving this task to a, a series of, 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 of uh, patients um, and controls, patients with hippocampal, frank hippocampal damage. So these are people where the scans show that they have damage in the hippocampus. And what you see is these, um, the, none of the, the controls or the patients have any problem with simple visual perception, being able to identify uh, 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 pictures simple visual memory, remembering that they had seen this picture before. Um, but when you start asking them to actually do this task, where they have to actually identify the uh, pictures from a different location, then they have great trouble um, if there's a two second delay. And even some of them have trouble if they're all presented right at the same time. And it turns out that this is a very sensitive task um, to what looks like the onset of, of, of AD. So if you test control patients, people with frank um, Alzheimer's dementia, and then two uh, other groups, uh, people with MCI who have um, positive signs of biomarkers in their cerebral spinal fluid, and who don't. And you see that there's a big difference between the controls and the, and the AD patients. And you see that, um, that the, uh, the, the test actually distinguishes, not perfectly, but quite nicely between um, MCI patients who have uh, uh, positive and, and negative biomarkers. And this, uh, there's a, there, they've done lots of work on the to go to, but there's a good correlation between their, um, their um, memory on this task and, and say, uh, the Campbell ball value. And in the latest work, it's looking as though this task is better, a better predictor of Alzheimer's uh, than the actual um, the hippocampal uh, volume, which is one of the standard clinical signs that's used. And the other thing we're doing is we're trying to see if we can test and specifically use spatial tests um, to see if we can see what's going wrong in rodent models, mouse models of, 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 of Alzheimer's disease. So there are uh, many uh, models out there, transgenic models and knock-in uh, models, 
where you can create some, but not all, of the aspects of, of, of the disease. Um, this is a, these are animals which had uh, overexpressed the, um, the beta proteins. And what we asked is, what's happening to the place cells as these animals get older? And what we found is that when the animals are young, these are the transgenics, um, the cells look for all intents and purposes like the cells that you see in the wild type. And then as the animals get older, there's not much change in the uh, spatial place cells uh, in the wild type, but some of the, um, of the transgenic animals begin to show severe signs of disruption of the place function, the spatial functions of the, of the, of the cell. Some of them are all right, and some of them are showing uh, really severe decrease in the amount of information they're providing the rest of the brain with the animal's location. And there's a good correlation between the plaque burden in the hippocampus and the spatial information that's, that you see in these animals. So it looks as though there's some correlation, some relationship between how much uh, plaques, how many plaques you get and how much plaque burden there is in the animal's actual um, um, a, uh, the, the activity in the hippocampal cells. And we also looked at spatial memories and found that that was correlated as well. Okay, so that's my story. Um, and I want to go back to those first points that I made right at the beginning. As I said, this is curios originally curiosity-driven research. Um, we were trying to find out what this part of the brain did in animals and to see how it functioned in memory for uh, space. And it turned out it was a specific kind of memory, a memory for spatial um, uh, information and uh, uh, that the animal could use to navigate and to locate objects in a familiar environment. We now see that having learned quite a bit about what this um, part of the brain is doing, we can use that information and, 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 and begin to now engage in translational research as well as continuing to engage in curiosity driven uh, research. So the brain is not a perfect model um, and we see that the hippocampus provides a cognitive map uh, which animals such as the rat can use to identify uh, locations and to navigate. Um, and we know quite a bit about how it does it in terms of the neural architecture and, and the, the, what the neurons are doing. We don't have perfect computational models yet which put together all of these pieces to tell us exactly how it works. But it's also clear that in addition to that function in humans, the hippocampus in humans has additional functions. So it's clear, for example, that in addition to being involved in spatial memory, the hippocampus in humans is also involved in episodic memory. So something is added. And we think that we have the bare bones of what the machinery can do, and that something has been added in, in, in human beings, um, which is, uh, takes the hippocampus into other areas of, of functioning in addition to what the, um, what the, um, uh, it does in animals. And you can imagine that some of these areas are things like, um, it's not clear that rats and rodents in general have a sense of linear time. It's a very, very uh, highly contested um, area of research. Some people see cells in and around the hippocampus, which look like they're at least coding for short periods of time. But if you think about what episodic memory is, it's the ability to actually say not only that you've been in a particular place and had a particular experience, but to do so at a particular time. So you have to be able to say, I did this in the past, it's happening to me now, maybe I'll do it in the future. And this addition of a linear time sense might be one of the things that it, um, changes the function of the hippocampus from a purely spatial system to something more like this episodic memory system. Another thing, of course, is that animals don't have this sense of themselves. They don't have a, they probably don't have a representation of themselves <coughs> as an entity. And that's, of course, one of the important additions. So not only do you know that you have a representation of the environment, but you know where you are in the environment and your place in the environment. And lastly, of course, um, there is the function of language. And we think that 
the left hippocampus has something to do with language, you don't know what, but clearly language as a whole of a layer of functioning uh, which takes it beyond the realm of, of most, most uh, animal um, brain functions. Finally, um, we thought that maybe some, uh, somewhere down the, 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 the line we might be able to address uh, diseases of memory uh, if we knew enough about how the hippocampus works. And I think it's clear that this is giving us some sort of purchase on the disease. Um, by our understanding of how the hippocampus operates in normal rodents, will give us the ability to design powerful tests of memory, and particularly <coughs> spatial memory, to test the dysfunction uh, of the hippocampus and the areas in these animal models. And it's also going to be uh, used, and we use it as a guide to develop spatial tasks for the early diagnosis of the, of the disease in, in humans. And finally, these are the funders of our research, the Gatsby Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. And um, as you heard generally say, I've been at UCL my whole career. And we now uh, have built a new institute for the study of the uh, neural circuits and behavior, uh, the Sainsbury Wellcome Trust, uh, uh, sorry, the Sainsbury Wellcome Center. And I thank you for your attention. say much about it because I want to save some time for people to ask questions who are more informed than me about the right questions to ask. <laughs> All I want to say is I found it absolutely fascinating. It gave me some insight into how really careful thinking allows you to design experiments that give you insight into answers that lead you to more thinking. The details maybe elude me, but I felt that's what it gave me. So thank you very much. And this, you know, this link between finding that perhaps a rat knows where it is and how to get to it, but doesn't necessarily experience, you called it episodic memory, I think. Yeah. I, I was thinking in terms of temporal yes. structure. And how this kind of thing gets teased out of these experiments, absolutely fascinating. But I want people to ask questions for John, not me to talk, so who'd like to ask it? Well, see somebody. You must have remembered something of what he said. Yes. <laughs> I'm interested to know how that That's a very good question, and um, I, uh, uh, some of my colleagues would tend to disagree with me. Uh, <laughs> but if you think that episodic memory involves uh, actually knowing not just ex experiences you've had, um, but where you've had them and also when you've had them, it's been very difficult to demonstrate that rats can do that. Um, there's some work um, that's been done at Cambridge in terms of, um, in terms of uh, crows who seem to know how long ago it's been that they buried something in a particular location. Um, but um, we haven't been able, and nobody's been able to do that in, in, uh, in, uh, in Norton's. So you would need to have evidence. So it's the absence of evidence. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's not proof that they don't have it. It's just until someone comes up with a demonstration that they do have it, um, one, one can leave it as an open question. Yeah. Um, given some popular uh, stereotypes around gender differences in spatial navigation, I wonder if you've any evidence from your rap work of any sex differences in these behaviors? So it's, it's, a, it's been a subject of study right from the, the, uh, the first uh, May study by, by Small. Um, people uh, looked to see whether there were differences in males and females and learning mazes and, and so on and so forth. And every once in a while there, um, there is uh, some evidence. Uh, I don't think there's much evidence in the Roman literature for differences in uh, uh, There's beginning to be, um, many people are asking the same question about human spatial abilities. And um, it's still a very much an open question. And I guess one thing you have to keep in mind is that in, and I didn't go into this, whereas the rat um, uses both of its hippocampuses to find its way around, 
um, humans have hit upon the trick of actually using only half the hippocampus to find their way around. And so there's this lateralization of function, not only in the hippocampus, but also in the, in the, in the neocortex um, uh, overall. And um, the, the, a rough, and it's very, very rough dichotomy between the two uh, functions of the two hemispheres is that the right hand side is doing very much something like what the rat is doing finding its way around, remembering where objects are located relative to each other in, in, in space. Whereas the left-hand side is more devoted to language. So you can almost think about uh, the possibility that you can choose how much of your hippocampus you're going to devote to one or the other. And there's some suggestion that females devote more of not only the hippocampus but the neocortex to um, something like language functions. Good question, and I don't know the answer. And I'm not sure anybody has, has done that yet, but it's, it's certainly, um, it, part of the problem is we're not exactly sure what that increase in size is. It almost definitely isn't an increase in the number of cells. The hippocampus is one of the few places in the brain which actually generates cells throughout life. And in fact, it evolves another one. But it, in this case, it's not, it's very unlikely that uh, the, the, uh, the increase in size is due to more cells. It might be due to more contacts between cells or synapses. Um, it might be more, due to more glial cells, other kinds of non neuronal components, but it's not really known. So whether, whether one would expect that to be a protective um, uh, is not known, but it's a very good, it's a very good question, and we don't know the answer. There was a mention about another difference between rodents and um, primates uh, that you made about being able to um, understand uh, themselves in the space. Uh, yes. Is it almost like a self, self a condition of self self awareness? Yes. Yeah. Self -awareness. Yeah. How would you test it in, if you were looking at the behaviors of rodents, and would it, and how would you would you see signals? So it's a good question, and um, we, we have the beginnings of, of a partial answer to the second part of it, which is that uh, a group in Israel working on bats, and of course bats are really like flying rodents, um, uh, and have many of the same cells, same cells with the same properties as, 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 as rats and mice. Um, they have reported, and it hasn't been um, confirmed in other laboratories, they reported that there are cells in the hippocampus which actually monitor the location of other animals. So, uh, and it's a very, your question is a very good one. It would be very, very difficult <coughs> to, to see how you would experimentally dem demonstrate um, the, this um, self-awareness and, and the awareness that you are in a particular location. So um, I think this work is is a um, is a, a, a bit of an advertisement for looking at animals that are free to move around in, in space and are, are not so hampered. Um, much of the work on on, on uh, in, in primates is done in animals which are very much more constrained, and um, and people are now beginning to use virtual reality to try to look at, at cells like this. Uh, but it's really early days, and then they haven't really um, uh, done very much of it. John, you made the point that the computational models aren't quite up to putting all this together to make us understand how things work. In your view, how much of that lack is due to the programmer not being clever enough or not having enough experimental information to plug in? That's a very good question, and I think. Um, one of the things that's lacking, at least in, in, in the rodent, is um, how the goal is represented 
in this in this whole um, represent, spatial representation, and how the if it, if it exists, uh, it is a theoretical um, a construct. Um, how the representation of the direction to the goal is represented. So again, going back to the work of the bats, um, um, the group in, in, in Israel suggests that they have found cells which represent the uh, heading direction to the goal. So these are cells which fire whenever the animal is actually pointing to the goal. We haven't seen those cells, nor has anyone else. And so right now, part of the uh, problem we have is that we have found most of the components of the system, but it's th we're still lacking at least an understanding of how you would represent say in the water base, how you would represent the location of the goal and the direction to the goal. That's what the animal is actually using. So, and I, I, I think it's just a question of a bit of luck for somebody to, to figure out exactly how, and the minute they find that, um, and it may be that we're not looking at it in the right way, that the representation is not seen in individual cells, but in the distribution of activity across the whole environment, and that it's at, the, at a network population level, not at the individual cell level. It's a good question, and I'm afraid I don't know the answer. <laughs> we like to believe that if it's happening, it's also happening in the hippocampus. Um, but I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Just to pass up our seven, I think we should draw this to a close. Can I just ask you to thank John again for that?